بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین بالقاسم محمد وعلى اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین الذی اضحب اللہ عنکم الرجس اہل البیت ویتحیرکم تطہیرا اللہم صل على محمد و آل محمد رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و حلل اگتم من لثانی یفقہ قولی و فضل امری الاللہ بسیر بالعباد سبحانک لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا ان اللہ و ملائکتہ یسلون علی النبی یا ایوہ الذین آمنوا سلو علیہ و سلمو تسلیما اللہم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد و عجیب السلام علیکم جمعیان و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ um, welcome everyone to our uh, session in uh, diving into the best verse in the Holy Quran um, while the while there are uh, you know different aspects of beauty in Quran um, Aytul Kursi is termed as the best verse in the Holy Quran and we have been going slowly slowly step by step with every verse in this um worse and we last time talked about illa as in emptying and going towards the no the no part of of emptying ourselves of what we don't want within us so that it can be filled what is divine and it's a very clear aspect that it is the self that is the first obstacle in in reaching the divine and if we are caught up and entangled with the self then we are not allowing that space for us to connect with the divine so i was uh, reading last night and um, uh, one of the most beautiful things that i read uh, which should have been in the beginning but um, you know whatever allah intends um, now looking at the verse itself i think kursi um you know the way we have been discussing the holy quran you all know that the whole focus is all about self transformation and the beauty about discussing the quran with the intention of self transformation is that it makes the book come alive it makes everything in the book mean excuse me mean so much more than just a text or theory that is we are reading but it makes it into something that we want to use, that we want to read, that we want to practice in our moment to moment in order for this to live through us. And the Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the idea of the, the reflection of the hidden book within us, which is reflected in the horizons. And so the human being, the cosmos, and the third aspect of this reflection is this book the holy quran and so we're seeing is that there is a triology there is there is a three dimensional um manifestation of the same reality so there's the cosmos there's the human being and then there is the book now so there is a microcosm and a macrocosm there is uh there is the world and then there is us and then we are reflected in the book so how are we going to use this in order for us to grow is that if you look at the verse uh, uh if you look at the name of this verse aital kursi we see that what is this kursi and kursi is translated as arsh the throne of god now i know we're going to come to this later but there needs to be this understanding of the relevance of the even idea of kursi the throne of god is it is it something high up in the heavens is it something which is very the- theoretical which is something very uh, mystical uh, something only for god something far beyond our reach something magical something powerful and majestic So yeah, it has these connotations of power and majesty and all of that. But then what is its relevance to my moment to moment everyday life? Why am I reading Aital Kursi every day when I want protection 
um, why am I being told to read Aydan Kursi, you know, like, um, especially we read it for protection, right? But we know that this idea of, uh, you know, seeking protection uh, through Aydan Kursi has to be deeper than just reading it, right? Now, the Urafa and the teachers tell us some things about Aydan Kursi, so I'm just going to share my screen. So over here in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, it says that generally the word throne, you can see if you can see my mouse, it says generally the word throne uh, can have the following meanings. It can mean the entire cosmos, the macrocosm, divine desire, knowledge, and the power which dominates the cosmos. And number three, the heart of the perfect man, Kalbul Insan Al Kamil. So now we have constantly been talking about how we need to come back to the heart, how we need to come back to the heart. We've been constantly talking about how the heart is the device that helps us, us connect to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so, you know, uh, it says that um, the, the Aytul Kursi is really, really potent because it has these uh, names of God. And it is that verse, if I'm not wrong, that has 17 uh, times the name of God is mentioned in this. Like a lot of verses will have names of God four times or maximum a couple of other times. But Aytul Kursi is that name that has so many verses of God. Now, when it has so many verses of God and it and we are being told that Kursi is the heart of the perfect man, we want to be able to understand its potency every single time we read it, every single time we even say the word, the verse of the throne. What is the verse of the throne? The verse of the throne is the verse of the heart of the man. And suddenly when we say that, it's like the throne that we always felt was majesty and power up above in the heavens. You know, it is here, right here with me now in this moment. You know, for me, um, the throne of God always reminded me of this, uh, this Greek mythology you know, where they're the gods in the heavens and the skies are like thundering and then there's this throne. Because um, if we look further, um, we will find that um, the, just a second, we will find that um, the verse of the throne, uh, the, the throne is mentioned so many times in the Quran. The Quran mentions the throne uh, some 25 times and 33 times as Al-Arsh, such as in the verse. Surah number 10 and number 3, which is mentioned here. Indeed, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days and established himself above the throne, arranging the matter of his creation. There is no intercessor except after his permission. That is Allah, your Lord. So worship him. Then you will not, will you, then will you not remember. So over here, uh, this is a verse that I use a lot in a lot of my work um, in healing, in, in self-discovery work that I talk about. And again, over here, you can see the word throne is used, Arsh, which is the which is used in Aytul Kursi as well. And then um, it is again in the latter verse, 23, 116. And it is he who created the heavens and the earth in six days and his throne had been upon water that he might test you as to which of you is best indeed. But if you say indeed you are resurrected after death, those who disbelieve will surely say this is not but obvious magic. Now what we're seeing here, uh, so exalted the true king, none has the right to be worshipped but he, lord of the supreme throne. Now what we're seeing here is that the word throne is coming again and again. And what is the relevance of this throne, um, right? And we said it's the heart of the man. 
Now, what is this heart of the perfect man? Now, Ibn Arabi also has some ideas around the throne. And um, one of the things that I found really, really beautiful. Um, okay, um, let me just open that. I forgot to share that here. So I'm just going to... Um, I won't be able to open that page right now, but according to Ibn Arabi, I'm going to read it out. So right now, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, in the past two, three sessions, we did start out in Ayat al-Kursi, but I never discussed the word Kursi, and today I was inspired to share it. Um, and so it's kind of like we're going back to the beginning of the lessons in Ayat al-Kursi, um, but it's just how it's come to me so i apologize for that um so ibn arabi talks about the throne and he says that yeah he says throne symbolizes the synthesis of all the cosmos and the earth of being thereof both the inferior conclusion and the center of fixation now if there is a synthesis here, if there is a there is a place of meeting, if the throne is a place of meeting, then we also see this over here that I've written. Over here, his throne extends over the heavens and the earth. Right? This is the translation of Aitan Kursi. His throne extends over the heavens and the earth. So now you can see that I'm all mm -hmm. over the place. I'm just giving you all these ideas about what the throne is, what is the Kursi, and... So the kursi is the entire cosmos, the kursi is the will of God, the kursi is, um, um, let me just fix this, I need somebody to be muted. Although I was uh, loving the background guitar, <laughs> okay. Um, so the throne, therefore, is something where everything is coming together. It is the cosmos, it is the heart of the man. And we talked about this Quran, the horizon and the heart. So there are these three aspects of the cosmos, cosmic reality, right? And we're trying to understand the throne that extends over heavens and earth. In order for us to make all of this relevant, the way I always try to angle the discussion, the way I always try to understand our discussion, has always been about bringing it to us. And therefore, if we say that the heart of the man is the throne of God, then heart of the man is also the place where two realities meet, the heavens and the earth. What is the heaven and what is the earth? The heaven is our inner world, our higher realms, our inner um, realities that connect us to, to God. And we've talked about how the six, you know, the six days and then the seventh one, the urge, is the seventh one being the throne, is we talk about the chakras, that there are these six, and then the seventh one is the seventh chakra of enlightenment. Um, we also talk about how Allah is establishing himself on the throne, and then Allah says, I cannot be encompassed in the entire universe, but I can be encompassed in the heart of a believer. And so the heart of the believer comes becomes that connection to God. Now, I was talking to my son, and he keeps asking, where is God, and how... How do, I, how do I understand God? And, you know, and he's just five years old. And, um, you know, he keeps, we talk about how Allah is in the heart, Allah is in the heart. And he gets confused and he starts saying, oh, then I will put the light of Allah in somewhere else. And then Allah won't be here. He will be there. And so it gets confusing, right? Because if Allah is in the heart, then heart is such a tiny thing in his body. And then I'm telling him Allah is everywhere, Allah is everywhere, Allah is the greatest. So, you know, the way I explained it to him was that, you know, we have these phone devices, right? We have these phones. And um, when 
when I'm talking to somebody on the phone, like if I'm talking to my mom. So I told my son, I said, when we're talking to Nani, is Nani inside the phone? Nani is not inside the phone. Nani is not so tiny. She cannot fit inside the phone. But there is a greater reality to Nani. But the way you communicate to her is through the phone. And the same way the heart is that device that connects us to God. But God is everywhere. And God is, no, there is none other than God. So the heart is that device that connects us to God. That's the phone to God. That's how you perceive God. That's how you get a glimpse of God. That's how you, you see God in the way he's supposed to be seen in our limited way. And therefore, the heart is the throne of God. The heart is the arsh of God. The heart is that place of establishment of the divine through which we can connect to him. Now, when Ibn Arabi says that the divine throne uh, is the arsh where, where um, you know, where he says that all the four, uh, you know, four or the five elements come together, where there's a synthesis of all the realities. So we can say that the human being is human and being. The human has these chakras that we were talking about and the human has this clay body, the earth, the earthly aspect to us. So we are the earth and we are the heaven. We are the seven heavens, seven chakras. We are the clay body, the dark mass and dense. And so within this human being comes together the, the ruh and the jism, the soul the spirit and the body. There's a synthesis. There's an amalgamation. And we reflect the how higher cosmos. We reflect the outer realities where Ibn Arabi talks about the spheres and all the mystics. They will talk about how they are. there are the celestial bodies, the heavenly bodies, the different planets. And according to them, the different planets are a representation of the different heavenly realities within the human being and then we see that we have the Quran which in itself talks about the seven heavens and, and the arsh and so we're seeing that there's in, in all the three dimensions we are being reminded of two realities and now I can't help myself but to mention that every single time we recite Surah Fatiha um, First of all, Surah Fatiha is seven verses, the Sabal Mathani, the seven oft repeated verses. And so these verses are um, uh, a representation of each stage of the spiritual journey. Now, in Surah Fatiha, um, we have this verse which says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And so in, the, in when we say alameen, again, we are talking about the inner and the outer realities. That Allah is the rub, the nourisher of the inner and the outer realities. And so we, you know, we understand that, that there, is this, um, there is this connection of God's presence being manifested through the heart of a believer. And what is a believer supposed to do? The believer is supposed to believe that they are a manifestation. They are a name of God that needs to be manifested. Allah says that I was a hidden treasure and I, and I wanted to be known. And so therefore, we connect all of this to the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to start my screen again. Um, and so we see that in Aitul Kursi, we see that we are reminded of the fact that there are all of these names inside um, Aitul Kursi. Now, according to the Quran, Adam represents the perfect man who is Khalifatullah, the vicegerent of God in the universe. 
Allah has taught the divine names only to him as his wise children. Finding and knowing these names in ourselves is the ultimate goal of Sufism, which is the key to realization of God, Marifat, uh, Irfan, Gnosis, or divine knowledge. As a well-known hadith states, he who knows himself knows his Lord. The Quran also says, And when your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place in the earth a Khalifa, they said, Will you place in it one who will do harm in it and shed blood as we celebrate your praise and extol your holiness? He said, Surely I know what you do not know. Then it says that, And Allah, he taught Adam all the names. Then he presented them to the angels and said, Tell me the names of these if you are truthful. And what did the angel say? Angel said, we do not have any knowledge of these names, right? Um, and they were asked to do uh, sajda to the human being. Awesome. Now, we have also talked about earlier how, um, you know, we've talked about how uh, the, the sajda to the Adam um, is because of this ability within the human being to say a no as well. We have that ability of making a choice, which the angels don't. We are living through a darkness that, that challenges us to manifest the hidden. Um, and that process of being in this earthly reality makes it possible for what is within us, what is hidden inside of us to manifest. And over here, you can see that um, in Sufism, they give a lot of importance to these four qualities of God. Hayat, life, which is a name of God inside Adil Kursi, ilm, knowledge, irada, willpower, desire, kudrat. Desire, kudrat, which is power. So basically, life, knowledge, willpower, and power. And um, we are going to be discussing these in the coming classes, so I don't want to give it away right now. But what I do want to discuss is the idea of um, the names and being a wise student of God. And the angels are, are in praise of God, right? So I'm going to go a little off tangent because um, I want to go into the discussion of Ilah. Um, that God is the Ilah, Allah is the, uh, the, the deity that we are worshipping and uh, the idea of praise because we use uh, praise a lot, right? Praising God. And so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, you know, con so consolidate this discussion on um, the word kursi over here and take it for the next time. And just to summarize, Kursi is the heart of, a, of the Insani Kamil, where comes together the, the rea different realities, the different worlds. And through this heart, we connect to God. Through this heart, we find divine knowledge. Through this heart, we find Marifatullah. And it is not possible to achieve it through the mind because the mind is limited mind fathoms that which is in the form the heart is the place of a recognition and uh, heart is the place of um, connecting to that which is formless that's why brain is connected to rational thinking of the form of the numbers of uh, quantity limitedness right heart is the place of that which is unlimited it is the place of um uh, love love has no form it is the place of um beauty appreciation and gratitude it all comes in the heart you know when we're feeling grateful we say my heart is so full today and so heart therefore is that place which is something beyond the seen something beyond the limited, something beyond the form. And we kind of keep getting caught up in moving back to our brain, our rational all the time because we are part of this cosmos. We are part of this reality, which is so dense. 
which is so material, which is so form. So that's why the insan, that the Adam to which the, the, the Farishte, the angels were asked to do sajda, has this tall order, has this divine purpose of constantly overcoming the dense reality and moving into this special world. Okay. And uh, so, so moving into the discussion of ilah now, um, what is the ilah? You know, uh, Allah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah, la ilaha, illa huwa. So, la ilaha, like, there is no God but Allah and He. So, ilah is, we talked about emptying ourselves of ourselves in the last class. But what is this ilah? There is no ilah. We have to understand that ilah is this, isn't this deity of an idol, you know, so direct, direct translation would be an idol, that there is no idol, there is no deity, there is no divine um, entity worthy of worshipping except Allah. Now, what is the ilah? I give this example a lot that, um, and I used to give this a lot earlier, is that, um, you know, the American Idol, the show American Idol, um, what does it do? What does the what does the word idol stand in the show for? You know, and they say the American Idol. Idol is somebody you make as an inspiration and you look up to that idol and that idol kind of starts to rule your life. Right. So an American in American Idol, they're trying to create celebrities. And who are celebrities? Celebrities are people who are so celebrated and so popular that you want to do everything that they do. You want to talk like them. You want to dress up like them. You want to do the things they're doing. So if they buy a bag, everybody wants to buy that bag. If they, you know, sing a song, everybody wants to sing that song. And so they have this sense of inspiration and it rules every aspect of our life, you know. They are the idol. So that means that an idol is somebody you emulate, right? And when you emulate an idol, that is the meaning of worship, okay? So you worship an idol, you emulate an idol. You worship an idol, your life becomes infused with their reality. And so we can make a lot of things idols in our life. And we start to do our life according to them. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I did not create jinn or ins to do anything except but to worship me. That means that then this worship that we don't understand, right? We're like, okay, Allah didn't create me to do anything other than worshipping Him. I can't be sitting on the janamas all the time. I can't be, you know, praying tasbih all the time. I can't be like, um, you know, like this person sitting in the masjid all the time. If that is what Allah is saying, I did not create insan and jinn to do anything except but to worship me. So now... Now we're understanding that worshipping means to emulate God. And because you emulate those celebrities, you make them into your idols. And instead of that, we want to emulate God. And to emulate God, we need to understand what He likes, who He is, what does He do, and where is His emphasis. And so we start to look at the characteristics of God. We start to look at the the beautiful names of God, which I was just talking to you about, that in Aitul Kursi, all of these names of God have been given. Now, there are um, two things that I want to talk about, um, you know, uh, in this discussion on uh, on Kursi, uh, on Ilah. The first is, um, when we worship an idol, we praise that idol we we say nice things right like it's so beautiful and it's we appreciate that idol we 
get inspired by their beauty. We don't get inspired by ugliness. We get inspired by the beauty. We see something good in it. Even like, you know, sometimes uh, kids will have uh, these superheroes as their idols. And sometimes I find them quite uh, scary. And they will be like, oh, this is my hero, you know. And some of these uh, idols will have snake skin and, you know, like things that kind of put me off. But they really like it. But why are they liking that? Because there's some aspect of that superhero that is inspiring them. That they are finding beautiful. They're finding beauty in it. So an idol will be somebody you will find beauty in. You will find appreciation in. You will praise it. And the other thing that happens um, in the idol is that you're seeking something out of it. So if we're not praying to that idol, but at least what we're doing is that we're taking inspiration from them, right? What did, what are they doing? How are they doing their lives? What kind of house are they living in? What kind of car do they have? What kind of fashion do they follow? And so we're trying to, we, we're seeking this perfection through them because we see perfection in them, right? We're seeing a perfection in their life. So we are seeking a perfection through them. And we want to make Allah our idol. We want to make Allah our role model. We want to make Allah the one who we are always following, you know. And the way Allah made it possible for us to do that, because he's an abstract entity and he cannot be, he cannot be grasped like that, is that first of all, he gives us his names. And then these are, uh, these are Asma al-Husna. And then these names are emulated by the Holy Prophet and the Imams who express to us Uswatul Hasana. And so Asmaul Husna come to us through Uswatul Hasana and Uswatul Hasana get translated into Makarimul Akhlaq, into beautiful character that is, that is manifested through the Holy Personalities. And then when we emulate those qualities, the emulation of those qualities and the names of God becomes worship. That is an inspiration into our lives of becoming the follower of this great entity. You know, now that is my Ilah. So when we look at the Ilah, you know, we see that there is a praise. Now, when we say... Um, when we say subhanallah walhamdulillah wa la ilaha illallah wallahu akbar there is this mentioning of uh, you know these four ways of understanding god here and it is really important that when we say tasbihat arba and we use these verses in our daily lives that they too invigorate us and give us a connection to god moment to moment and it is a part of our of a dhikr too so alhamdulillah that is all praise to allah is connected to this idol because we praise and worship god now ilah this deity that we want to praise um what alama tabatabai says in his tafsir and which is also something i found inspiration into is the fact that it is not possible to praise anyone other than Allah. So I'm not saying that right now the discussion that we're doing is that what should we do? We should praise Allah, right? What, how should we praise is, is explained through different mediums. Like we, we praise Allah through our tongue. We praise Allah through our character. We praise Allah through emulating his beauty. It's, it's a way of praising him through taking inspiration. But here what we're saying is that it is not possible no matter what we do and no matter who we praise it is not possible that i would praise anyone other than allah and that is a very deep truth like it's a fact like nobody can run away from and why is that is because i always quote neil donald walsh who says um 
there is uh, the, the God is the single ingredient of the universe. If God is the single ingredient of the universe and there is no reality other than Allah and every single atom that is energetically moving is moving with that divine life, with, is being invigorated, it is being enlivened through divine energy, is through that li living force, then the living force is one. The living force that brings the unseen into the scene, the living force that uh, makes the hidden manifest, the living um, uh, the living life that is the life of every um, quantum particle is all one, then no matter who you praise, no matter who you appreciate, you find beauty in, in the end, eventually you are praising only one. And that is the one life force and that is God. And so no matter, you know, Allah says in the Quran, go, is try to escape me. Go wherever you want to go. Like, can you escape my kingdom? You can't because there is not, nothing other than him, no matter where you go. And that's why even when you praise, can you escape praising God? You can't escape praising God. That's why, you know, when we look at the mystics and the awliya, they have this love for their enemy. They have this love for the, the worshippers of stone and wood. They have this love for people who don't accept God. When the Holy Prophet went to Taif and he wanted to give them the message of one God, you know, they threw stones at him and our Holy Prophet was bleeding. And Angel Jibreel comes and he says, would you like us to, uh, you know, would you like us to destroy this city? Because they were so like, destructive towards you they cause you so much pain and the holy prophet said no leave them you know they're just children they don't understand if they knew they would surely believe if they understood they would surely believe they just don't understand and why are they why why are why are the prophets and the imams so kind and loving towards people who are mean destructive you know um so anarchic is because they don't see any anything other than Allah you know and their love is for Allah so if there is nothing but Allah then their heart is always seeing that reality behind the facade and um, you know our scholars they give us the example of the thread in the fabric so whether it's denim jeans, whether it's a sweater, whether it's a cotton shirt, whether it's a, you know, it's a jacket, it's all made of the same thread, you know, so their forms look different, but their reality is one. And so the thread behind the fabric, the life behind the formed image, it's all one. And so we cannot escape Allah. We cannot escape his presence. We cannot escape that reality which is the overpowering, encompassing, all living reality. So that is one and uh, that is why um, we have to understand that the diversity of good and bad that we see in the world has been meticulously planned and designated by God. This is how he has been he has decided to be known he he has manifested himself deliberately in this manner so that through this we seek him and through this we recognize him and so through the opposites of the dunya of the of what we see as dark and light good and evil um bad and good that the, the all of this is part of his plan. He has, he has decided it to be this way. This is in his will and power. And nothing is out of order or a coincidence or an accident. None of it is an accident. Um, and the other is seeking. So, you know, when we seek God, um, there are people who will be seeking 
um, through idol worship, through, you know, different deities like, you know, Krishna and Vishnu and, you know, all of that. And someone will worship Buddha, someone will worship, you know, other deities, you know, someone will make um, Jesus into son of God. Now, all of them or, you know, all these people who seek what they want in life through these deities that they've made, the idols that they've created, and a lot of what they will pray for, they will get. And we can wonder, um, you know, they have lack of Tawheed and yet they are receiving what they're asking for. So this method of seeking and asking and getting is all a very, um, it's a very, you know, um, it's a law. Like there's a law of gravity, right? There's a law of uh, whatever, right? All these scientific laws that we have. They just work. You know, and they work because that's the system. And even in seeking, you know, when somebody asks Bhagwan, eventually there is none that can be seeked or sought. There is no, no entity that can be sought other than Allah because there is no reality other than Allah. However, now, while I've explained to you that you can't praise anyone other than Allah and you can't seek anyone other than Allah because that is the only reality. The labels can change, the names can change, um, you know, imagery can change. But in the end, that power is one. Yes, that is true. In the end, you cannot escape. In the end, you cannot deny. You, you just end up getting to that one life force, the universe. But what is what is the true inner journey for us, the real journey for us, is to wake up. To wake up from the outer symbols and wake up from seeing the denim jacket and the pants and the shirt and the cotton scarf and see the thread. This seeing of the thread, this seeing of the life force, this going beyond the whales and recognizing the truths behind all of that is our awakening, is our true um, saying labek. Yes, okay, that is the awakening. And so that's why we see in Ayatul Kursi, Allahu la ilaha. Illa who? So Allah is He. There is none, no other idol except He. And so what we're seeing here is that there is only Allah. There is only Him. There is none other than Him. But at the same time, there will be idols. And one of the biggest idols is the self. Me, myself. This is one of the biggest idols. And so I need to start the, this process of purging myself out of the way of seeing myself as an, as, as, a, uh, as an obstacle to going deep behind all of these whales and seeing who the true, um, what is the truth? What is this true uh, deity? Who, what is this divine energy? And in all of this seeking of the rub of this God, then what I always say is that it needs a removal of the horizontal. So everything in the horizontal realm in this dunya is the symbol. It is just a manifestation. It is just an outer imagery. It is not the real. And what we're seeking is the haq, the truth, the real. That is where the real power is. And so when we leave the symbols of God, when we leave 
names and labels of God, then we are moving into a journey towards the Hua. Okay? So the Hua, the mystics say, is that Hua is He. And the reason they say He is because they say that it's not just He like a masculine He. It's just pointing towards an entity that cannot be described. So you can say It. What is the It? It cannot be described. It's beyond our reach. It's that essence that cannot be described. But yes, there are mystics who say that there are levels of experiencing this essence. There are levels of experiencing this reality of he, who are it. Because, like we said, the throne, the throne of God, the arsh of God, the heart, is that device that can that can feel God, right? Through the heart we feel. So through feeling is we is the is that device through which we can reach that glimpse of the he, which is beyond words. So when we start to go beyond the horizontal symbols of God, deities of God, you know, Bhagwan, Vishnu, Krishna, all of that, Buddha, um, even us as Muslims, we idolize, you know, sometimes we idolize our imams and prophets to the level where we start to seek through them. So when we go beyond all of that, you know, then the reality is just one. There is only oneness. There is only Tawheed. There is only one reality. There is only one God. And why did I mention that even as Muslims we do that? Because a lot of times we get stuck, um, okay, I can say the imams and the prophets because sometimes we forget what the imams wanted from us, what the prophet wanted from us. We forget about the message and we get stuck in their idol worship and we forget that they too are limited. They're limited and they were just the finger pointing towards the sun or the moon and we start worshipping the finger. And so it becomes a very limited journey when we get stuck in the symbols and we get stuck in the, um, in the horizontal. Now another way that we get stuck in the horizontal is uh, all the causes and the effects of the horizontal reality. And what I mean by the causes and the effects of the horizontal reality is that if we're seeking abundance from God, then we need to seek abundance directly from God. We should not be seeking money. What do I mean by that? We think that when I have a bigger bank balance is when I can have what I want. When I have physical cash in my hand, that is when I will get what I want. Because that is how the horizontal world works. So that the money in my hand is my means to getting what I want, right? It is the cause. I will have so much cash in my hand so I can go and get a nice meal of sushi, for example. How will I remove money and cash as a means of seeking the sushi directly is for example sometimes i I've, I've heard it from my own friend she said i was um, really in the mood of having dokras i don't know if, yeah you know dokras right um, some people call it doklas um they're like savory cakes and she said that i was really in the mood for eating those and I'm just thinking about it and the bell rings and uh, I have somebody bringing Dokla saying, you you know, this is from some friend or her mom or somebody had sent her that exact food. She didn't need money for that. It was just this deep inner seeking in her heart and it got to her. And, you know, Rumi says what you're seeking is seeking you. Those Doklas were seeking her, you know. Um... And that's another discussion into perfection through the, so the, the word sabbaha and subhan and all of that. But I'll leave that for now. But 
everything is seeking its perfection and humans the perfection of human being lies in letting go of anything which is not worthy of their um honor and it is not worthy of our honor that we become enslaved to the world that was created to serve us allah says that i created the world for you and i created you for me when we believe that what we seek and the and whatever purpose we have and the intentions we hold are dependent on physical horizontal entities then we're getting caught up in the causes and the effects and so what we want to understand is that we want to really go deep within ourselves and understand that this ilah this god that we're worshiping this god that we're praising this god that we're emulating is the god who is our support system is the god we keep going back to when we need something in our point in our moments of need and so when we ask him for what we need and what we want we do not want it to be dependent on anything in the horizontal realm so what is it that i seek i seek goodness i seek love i seek abundance these are qualities of perfection these are qualities of god himself and so when i seek this i do not want to be dependent on money i do not want to be dependent on uh, a provider a human being my boss for the promotion i do not want to be dependent on my neighbors i do not want to be dependent on anybody but that's how the world works and we have to break out of these chains and directly seek what our heart is seeking directly from him and uh, i'm sure glam uncle will love this um uh, dr wayne dyer says um say yes and forget about the how just say yes don't worry about the how how are you going to get it is all about the causes this will happen and this will happen and that will happen then i will get this then i will get that right so much so that you even let go of the personal people in your circle and you don't depend on them so it is not about a physical emancipation it is not about letting go of people in our physical reality it is not about changing people in our physical reality even a lot of times we seek happiness by saying you know if only this person changes in my reality that i will find peace and joy and happiness now you're making this person a means you're saying he is the cause of my happiness but we want to go to the source we want to make god the ultimate source and the ultimate um cause of any effect we see in our life and he is the wajibul wujud you know in mysticism god is the wajibul wujud the necessary existence his existence is all we need in our life and so whatever we seek needs to be sought without any conduits in the middle without any you know any any uh, any thing that we are dependent on other than him and that is the way of tawhid where there is only one direct connection and from allah we are going to um have this connection where if i seek joy and if i seek happiness if i seek freedom if i seek any of it then it has to be a direct connection of him of god in the heart so one last thing that is very important in to be mentioned here is when we do that then we also have to let go of the imagery of what we're seeking um so you know when we seek freedom then what is freedom freedom from people freedom from people's criticism freedom from a uh, law when we're seeking happiness is it seeking through people making me happy giving me things these are images in our mind we have to let go of these images allah says in the quran he says that wa may yattaqillah yaj'al lahu makhrajan you know whenever when 
when you do tawakkul in him then he will find a makhraja he will find an exit for you he will find a way out for you he will bring to you what you don't expect so going directly to him means that you let go of what your expectations are okay for example um the way these classes started there was a deep desire in my heart uh more than a year ago uh maybe 2 years ago um to share with people what i learned through quran and whatever inspirations i get and um god bless my teacher she was teaching quran in the same vicinity and um i also did not have any place within my uh, home where i could have a conference table or a meeting area where i could call people over and this is before covid and um you know i used to uh, wonder how and when i would be able to share this work and i just told her this is your work this is from you and this you know if this is meant to reach people then it will reach the way it has to reach and uh, in those days there was no uh, there was no like a popular idea of zoom or any of it and i let it go and somebody in canada said that you know a friend of mine said that my husband and i we just want to hear your work so with two people on a zoom call uh suddenly i was asked to share my quran work and uh, today there's a whole community reading and hearing this work and i didn't need a table i didn't need a conference room and like i was saying my teacher was in the same vicinity so i was feeling really weird that you know how can be being a student how can i start a class when she's already teaching you know she's my teacher and so living here i'm not teaching that neighborhood it's a completely different community it is mind blowing how allah works that it worked out but not none of it was expected it was a completely completely different manifestation of a desire like what i could expect was nothing close to this and it's just beyond our understanding how allah will manifest that desire so we have to go directly to him without any means and then we also have to let go of how it will manifest because then we when then we let the god beyond limitations to decide how it will manifest and therefore um i will end my class now that this idol this ilah that we you know we want to worship has to be only and only allah and if we create any causes other than the original cause of everything allah is the original cause then we we are polluting this connection then there is a polluting of this tawhidi connection and so we want to be very mindful of understanding um to let go of any uh any uh any other than allah to be in the way because then that becomes a distraction that becomes a veil and um you know that is what we're talking about that the essence of god the hua that cannot be understood is beyond our understanding beyond our expectation and it cannot be substantiated and it has be it has to be sought through a conscious awakening in moment to moment practice of letting go of the self of any other idol of any other means of any other causes other than allah subhanahu wa taala and to remember that this can be sought through the heart which is the throne which is the arsh of god and this is where the two realities meet the heart the human of the human being is the place where the light and the dark come together the dense and the and the luminous come together where the heavens and the earths come together so that 
that which is haq that which is true can manifest itself through us so i'm just going to end this here shukr alhamdulillah and uh, if you have any questions then i'll finish the dua and please stay on and you can you know speak to me through the chat the recording will stop after the dua a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillah ar rahman ar rahim O oh Allah, we put our hands up towards you and you alone. O oh Allah, purify our hearts and intentions. O oh Allah, help us in seeking only and only you in every moment of our lives. And O oh Allah, remove all that is other than you in our hearts. For this is a sanct, sacred space. This heart is a sacred gift. O oh Allah, there is no... words there are no words there is no way we can express our gratitude for getting this opportunity to be one of those chosen ones who were brought from the unseen to the seen who were who were brought into existence to experience this experience called life through which we experience you through every moment O oh Allah we were not worthy but it is only your karam and fazl that you gave us this opportunity this adventure called life an awakening an experience through which we can experience that which cannot be fathomed or or imagined or thought of O oh Allah open our hearts to this experience O oh Allah we have taken the first step of setting the intention of seeking you and you alone O oh Allah we are stuck in the realm of the kabad we are stuck in the realm of chaos O oh Allah but there is no chaos in your reality there is only order O oh Allah open our eyes to this order O oh Allah open our hearts to this reality O oh Allah we are seeking O oh Allah make this seeking pure and holy O oh Allah we are yearning O oh Allah make this yearning only and only for you O oh Allah this tawfiq of seeking and yearning is also from you how is it that we can ever show our gratitude for any of this when the inspirer is you and the giver is you and you are the one who take us by our hands through every step of our journey O oh Allah keep us in your loving mercy and protection O oh Allah open our eyes to this love and protection so we can be cognizant of you and your beauty and your appreciation in every moment of our every um moment of our life shukr alhamdulillah rabbil alamin i'm going to stop